Welcome everyone to Tech Canada's Deeper Insights webinar series. My name is Ruth Ann Marley, and as always, it is my pleasure to host these series. And today, Dr. Andrew Woods is joining us. And this is a pretty special uh, webinar, uh, Dr. Woods. I don't think you know this, but this is our 100th webinar that we have uh, run from Tech Canada since the beginning of the, uh, the pandemic uh, as a support to all of our business leaders across Canada and worldwide. So it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Andrew Woods is an adjunct professor in cross-cultural communications and Chinese negotiation strategies for triple credited business schools across uh, both Canada and through China. I've invited him here uh, because he's not only a professor, but he's written several books. He's uh, and in, in that authorship, he uses his experience in strategic planning and cooperative uh, adventures that he's been working with in China. And I know that this is kind of a hot topic right now. And we were chatting before we came on air about the sort of the um, the, the feeling that's going on right now. So I think, Dr. Wizard, I think you're going to address some of that and uh, yeah. go into the economic uh, opportunities that are there for Canadian business leaders, both small and large. I would like to encourage everyone, please put your comments and your questions into the question box. And Dr. Woods will make some opportunities for us to engage in those. So without further ado, welcome. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, honored that it's the 100th episode. That's fabulous. Um, and I'm going to jump right into this um, for everyone here. Um, and yes, that was a great introduction because we are going through a challenging time right now in uh, uh, Sino-Canadian relations. Um, you know, I'm going to try and keep this as much of an economic discussion because I believe that, um, you know, governments and people are two different entities in, in many cases. And, and the experiences I had in, in China dealing with the people were amazing. I mean, so entrepreneurial, so go, 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 optimistic for the future. Um, but definitely we are in a period of, of uh, heightened tensions, uh, with, with not only with Canada and China, but with the Western world and China. Um, a lot of the, the issues uh, the, and challenges that are being brought up are actually issues and challenges that have been around for many years. And only those of us that maybe were on the inside were, were aware of, of, of these things. Um, but I wanna keep this uh, um, positive and encouraging. And I wanna talk about the economics more than the politics, but I won't shy away from the politics if those questions are asked. Um, as uh, Ruthann had mentioned, if you wanna ask questions, please do type them into the chat box. And if enough questions accumulate, I'm happy to, uh, to um, right away jump into those as we go along. I think it's more beneficial when the topics are fresh. Um, so let me uh, give you a little bit of um, information about my background on China or in China. Um, I was living in the UK um, studying an MBA and it was an international MBA. And I felt that uh, this was in Cardiff in the UK. And, um, the class was very segregated. It was sort of one section was it, the uh, recruiters recruited heavily in India and in China, and of course in the local market. So it was an international MBA, but you had a group of uh, Indian students sitting in one section, a group of Chinese students sitting in another section. And in the front section was a smaller cohort of, um, of uh, local uh, Cardiff uh, students, so it was one Canadian. Um, and I thought, you know, I was reading so much at the time, this is about 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago. And I was reading so much in the time of, of uh, China's uh, emerging power and growing economically that I felt that it, it was necessary to make contacts on this program with uh, Chinese people. Uh, so I went out of my way to uh, contact both uh, the Indian co uh, students and, uh, and uh, Chinese students. And when the course was done, unbeknownst to me, um, uh, I believe it's Tong Shui is the, the, uh, the word, which is classmates, is a very big part of relationships in, in uh, China. So my classmates were uh, quite pleased that, that I had uh, sort of taken them under my wing in, in Cardiff, that they actually invited me to go and uh, live and work in China. This gentleman owned an advertising firm and it spiraled into a lot of other uh, fabulous opportunities. Um, so I've had the opportunity, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to teach seminars on doing business in China, uh, selling to China, but also on the wider cross-cultural communications 
um, in over 22 countries. I think we're probably closer to 30 now. Um, in 2018, I was the editor and contributor for the Shanghai Inward Investment Guide. So that was a, uh, a book produced to uh, help with uh, inward investment or foreign companies looking to invest in, um, in, uh, in China. Uh, most recently, um, I finished a doctorate degree and, and uh, did my research primarily on the art of Guangxi, which while I hit at a little bit later in the presentation, but essentially, um, it's sort of the style of relationships and the networks of relationships. Um, and I examined whether that was going into uh, corruption and, and how that was sort of viewed by uh, outsiders. Did they have access to the, the market or were they naturally penalized for, for, for not having this insider's uh, uh, network? Um, in 2013, um, I set up a business, a consulting business, to deal with the lack of cultural understanding, which is relevant today as it was then. Um, going American companies, British companies, and Canadian companies, and all Western companies, a lot of them would go into China, and they would have a manual, an HR manual, and a playbook that worked in, in their home country, drop it on a desk and say, this is the way it's going to be here without taking the time to understand the, the cultural differences, the importance of, of uh, understanding your, you know, you're in another, uh, another country you need to develop and adapt. Um, many of these companies that are now successful are the ones that did adapt. Companies like Starbucks, uh, McDonald's that altered their menus to cater to local as well as um, expat communities. Um, and was mentioned, I had the great opportunity to teach entrepreneurship um, at Emlion University Business School in uh, Shanghai. And it was fabulous because I had cohorts of 50 uh, to 100 people and they were almost equally mixed between French students that were visiting China and Chinese students. So we had incredible negotiations. Let's wipe all of that away and say, that's not even close to being as important as the 10 years of living in China and living in China 10 plus and living as a local. So I lived on a little laneway house, um, spoke Chinese relatively poorly, but still tried, uh, but immersed myself in the culture. And I think that was the most beneficial uh, step moving forward uh, for me. So uh, I think what people don't grasp, and I'm, I'm, I'm acting on the assumption that a lot of you have already been to China, but I'm also going to uh, try and appeal to people that have maybe never been. So we'll try and, you know, for some people, this might be a little bit of review and for others, it will be have some eye-opening figures and, and facts. Um, Shanghai, in, 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 um, uh, the, even the time I was there, was just expanding so massively. It, it has a population anywhere between 20 and 25 million, where a lot of people say it could be upwards of 30 million because there's no way of tracking the migrant workers that come from the countryside looking for economic opportunity. So Shanghai in some ways, and I don't want to upset anybody from other cities, but in Shanghai in some ways could be the New York uh, to the American dream as Shanghai is to the um, Chinese dream. The idea that you go there and you can make things happen and you can sort of move and shake and assimilate. Um, and it's just a real go, go, go powerhouse of, of a city. Um, this is a view uh, taken um, basically from the office window of where I was working for a time when I first arrived. Um, as you can see, it's an absolutely enormous concrete jungle. Um, it is just, it's so go, go, go. It's so fast moving. Um, and there's a period of cultural adjustment, both when you go there as an expat for a long-term assignment, or when you come back from there, you have reverse culture shock when you come back to Canada and maybe things move a little bit slower uh, than you were used to in, uh, in China. Um, so let's, let's have a look here um, at some figures, but let's also have a look at some cultural pieces. Um, so this is a very common term uh, that's, that's been translated, uh, may you live in interesting times. And I think that because of the rapid development of China, you figure in 1979, when the leader at the time, Deng Xiaoping, um, coined the phrase Gai Ge Kai Feng, which meant opening up to the world or opening up, the rapid development. Um, he also, by the way, um, uh, was responsible for the phrase to get rich is glorious, um, which coming from a, a, a communist society, um, much more communist at the time, 
um, was a fabulous uh, uh, statement to the people. So in other words, to, to, to get rich is glorious. And, and the reason why I put these pictures here is I think it's fascinating that a uh, woman on the left who is my wife um, is pictured with a Canadian um, uh, well-known trophy being the Stanley Cup. Probably didn't know what the Stanley Cup was until she met me. And uh, if you asked me 20 years ago, if I'd be in this photograph in the right, with this extended Chinese family, uh, I would have thought you were crazy, but it's just amazing the way the world has come together. Um, and that's why I wanna try and keep this a positive discussion because there's a lot of benefits to our relationship with China as, as well as the negatives that we began the presentation with. So basically it's the numbers that are staggering. Everything that's done in China is done um, writ large on, on, the, on a massive scale. Um, the, the projections for um, you know, the, the economic uh, growth of China, it's projected that sometime in the next 10 years, and keep in mind that in 2005, it was also projected that sometime in the next 10 years, it would become the world's leading uh, economy based on uh, um, GDP, um, GDP, but not GDP per capita. So China has a long way to go to catch up to the United States and other uh, Western or first world countries when it comes to GDP per capita. I believe their GDP per capita is about 10,000 plus USD, give or take a few dollars because it goes up and down. Um, and uh, ours, I think is somewhere in the fifties. So, um, you know, the GDP per capita, no, but growing rapidly, but they're, uh, They've already overtaken the United States to be the most powerful economy in the world in purchasing power parity. So the amount of items that your dollar, or in this case, RMB, can buy are significantly higher in uh, China due to the cost of living. Um, one thing to think about if setting up a business in China or if manufacturing is the, is the idea that the cost of living is increasing. Um, it was recently um, uh, stated in a, a business journal, I believe it was Forbes, but don't quote me on that, that China, Shanghai is now considered the most expensive city in the world. Um, what's fascinating about that, though, and what might be different from living in Vancouver, where I am now, is you can have two lives. You can live a very local existence where your cost of living and your food and your, you know, if you're eating local foods are very inexpensive. Or you can have a sort of a Western lifestyle where you're eating out in higher level places where it would be even more expensive in Western properties, uh, hotels, Four Seasons, et cetera, Marriott. It would be more expensive than it is in uh, the West. So it's rapidly changing. And if there's one thing to take away, it's the speed of how things change. A lot of innovations, a lot of ideas that are uh, big here, let's say the use of credit cards. Credit cards started in China and then they completely leapfrogged over that and went to um, mobile payments. So credit cards are sort of a very small amount of the, uh, of the uh, payment system, whereas uh, um, uh, credit, uh, uh, sorry, uh, mobile payments through applications, you may have heard of WeChat, which is a multi-purpose uh, app um, that's very popular in China. Uh, Alipay, et cetera. So the, 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 the idea that some of these things don't take off, well, they do take off, but then they're off, often, there's a leapfrogging over. So you don't, a lot of people don't use laptops, people use mobile phones for all their transactions, communications, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's the, the, back to the numbers though, it's projected that China's economy by 2050 could be double the size of the United States. Now there's a lot of variables in there, but the speed of growth is incredible. Since 1979 till now, the speed of growth, the amount of wealth, the amount of attention, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, a lot of the things that people are complaining about now have been going on in China for years. And they're only coming to the forefront now um, because the whole idea was that the more wealthy China became, the more likely they were to adapt the uh, democratic values. Um, and this has not been the case. They've, uh, the wealthier they've become, in many ways, they've become more um, 
uh, back to they're reverting back to some of the Maoist uh, uh, Mao's ways of, of thinking. So it's it's uh, they're a wealthier country reverting back to old uh, ways. Um, <clears throat> many of you may, may <coughs> excuse me. Many of you may have come across uh, the concept of One Belt One Road, uh, which was renamed the Belt and Road Initiative. And in Chinese, this is referred to as Idai Ilu or One Belt One Road. Now, this is a massive infrastructure plan that the Chinese government, led by uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping, put forward um, uh, at the beginning of his term, sort of uh, 2000, he was, st term started 2012, late 2012. Uh, this idea started to generate around 2013, and it was the idea of excess capacity in, uh, in China that th that could be exported and could be um, uh, loans and infrastructure could be built in other countries. Now there's 70 participating countries to date. Um, it does have some controversy around it that a lot of people are suggesting that it's debt diplomacy. So, uh, you know, big vast loans are being given to smaller countries who then can't pay back these loans. And then it's you know, pieces of their land are being given up or critical infrastructure is given up. Um, but the idea of the policy was to build a, uh, a road, an old, to reju uh, rejuvenate, excuse me, the Silk Road, trading road, uh, going from China out into, across Eurasia, into Europe and back, and a uh, maritime route as well. So it's off to a little bit of a rocky start, um, but it's projected to um, uh, be uh, dealing with over a trillion dollars worth of uh, investments. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. There are numerous opportunities for companies, whether it be Canadian companies or other companies to get involved in this. Um, and it shall be interesting to see how it evolves over time. Um, this is something I get asked about a lot and the concept of Thucydides trap. So I'm going to explain this concept. Um, a Harvard professor, Graham Allison, um, who is very knowledgeable about uh, Chinese history, and uh, uh, they offer a very good um, uh, online, easily accessible course covering the 6,000 years of, of Chinese history. Um, but uh, he came up with a um, research um, program which looked at um, something that he coined called Thucydides' Trap. And Thucydides was a historian um, many years ago who during the, uh, you know, looked at the Pol Peloponnesian War and the concept that a um, rising Athens and a, a, a stumbling uh, Sparta um, that that you know a ruling that ultimately a ruling uh, uh, a ruling and a rising power are going to go to war, and this actually happened twelve out of sixteen cases in history. So there's a lot of talk right now: is are the U.S. and China destined for war? And actually, Allison's book is called "Destined for War," and I highly recommend you have a look at it because it really, in time that I can't in this webinar uh, do it justice talks about all the areas in which China is expanding rapidly, in which it's becoming the largest in what it does, largest tourism market, soon to be the largest film industry. It's just growing in all kinds of different directions. So Allison's concept is that, you know, are we headed for war and what can we do to um, put the brakes on on this? And really, you know, it started uh, to during the Trump administration, this, the, the conflict began to escalate and it's still carrying on now. So we're really in the recent events, you know, with Canada, with Australia, um, it's, it's uh, fascinating to watch and see how this, uh, this um, uh, unfolds. Uh, okay. When you guys, if you do decide that you're either going to go to China to set up business or you're going to remotely set up business um, with China, and we'll discuss some of the opportunities that, that I feel are truly unique for Canadian companies um, um, moving forward, but you need to prepare for culture shock and miscommunication and um, you know, it, 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 the, the, no matter how many books you read, certainly going back 15 years plus, 
when I went to China the first time, um, I armed myself with as much information as possible. I read all the books at the time that were um, old China hand and, you know, a thousand customers and China CEO and sorry, 1.4 billion customers at the time is 1.1, I think it's called. Um, all these kind of books explaining to you how to prepare for culture shock, impossible. You cannot prepare for culture shock. And the, the small little mistakes, and the reason why I put this picture up is the small little mistakes, even in things like, you know, this guy is a picture here of a person um, having a toast with a, with a Chinese person. Now, in, in the younger crowds, they're, they're in many ways quite westernized. They've spent time overseas or they're familiar through media, through film. But the older generation, there's certain taboos and there's certain things that we often do as Westerners and make mistakes. One of them that stands out to me is the whole notion of uh, cheers, you know, uh, clinking a glass with someone. And what I didn't realize in my first ever meeting in China, I went to uh, well, an area that we all are quite familiar with now, which maybe people didn't know a couple of years ago, was the city of Wuhan. I went to Wuhan University to uh, pitch a concept, an advertising concept to their, um, their uh, senior executive uh, team. And uh, as Chinese are, are very well known, uh, Chinese uh, uh, business people and, and people in general, very well known for uh, fabulous, uh, gracious uh, hosting, uh, skills, they put on a massive uh, uh, gala sort of dinner uh, for us. And I was running around to all the tables, drinking a very strong drink called Baijiu, which I highly recommend. And even the UK embassy told us to spit it out or avoid drinking it at all costs. Um, but it's a very strong drink that is uh, that you drink in um, in uh, settings where you're doing business with, with uh, your, uh, your Chinese hosts. And I was clinking everybody's glasses but I was clinking above the glass. And actually, unbeknownst to me, I needed it to go below to show a sign of respect. Now, how are you gonna know these little things that can be the difference between insulting people and getting on with people? Sure, you can read about them, but it all comes through time spent on the ground. So you can prepare as much as you want for China. And I highly recommend you do that but you will always be still uh, learning. And I'm still learning today. There's a very popular phrase used to describe people who've spent a lot of years in China and have studied and read about the culture and maybe have, uh, are, are involved with Chinese families. And that's a Chinese expert. By no means would I classify myself as a Chinese expert because I have so far to go to learn and I learn every day with, with this uh, amazing culture. Um, so preparing for culture shock, get out there, experience it, learn, and then make the decision whether your product, your service is viable in that market. Um, very often, and I was guilty in the past too, of thinking my products or services or what I wanted to pitch would work and not maybe understanding it from the perspective of a Chinese consumer. So now I go out of my way um, and my own business goes out of its way to do a focus groups. So we spend the time to understand what people are looking for, trends, uh, because what flies in the US, what flies in Canada, what flies in Europe could well be completely different or need to be adapted for that market. Uh, right. There's something that I said I would mention, and that is the art of Guangxi. And uh, I recently had the opportunity to produce a book on my research on Guangxi that I did over the course of about five years. And um, this was looking at the systems and the sort of the network of reciprocity of favors and how it differs in the Western world and in China in particular, and throughout um, Asia as a whole. Um, Guangxi is a very interesting concept because it's a misunderstood concept. And a lot of people believe that they need to have this. Uh, so there's a whole industry in China of people, maybe less so now, of trying to sell you and say to you, they have Guangxi, they have networks, they have connections. And by joining with them or working with them, you will be part of that system. Uh, Guangxi, even after the research, it came apparent that it still definitely does exist, 
but in the younger generations, perhaps it's relevance or prevalence is diminishing or you know lessening over time so guangxi's the art of reciprocity of networks i mentioned earlier the importance of classmates of relationships of favors so my classmates would feel in in particular in chinese culture they might adapt to to me as a as a canadian uh, but they would feel that they could ask me as a result of our time spent together, they could ask me for favors. So that favor might be, oh, you are working at this particular university. Perhaps you could organize for a interview with my son or daughter. And I would respond by saying, yes, I can do that because it would be sort of a balance almost of uh, favors, I would then feel free to call on this individual person for a favor. Why it has gotten such negative um, uh, news, and remember this is a concept from many thousands of years ago when there was no legal system, so you had to deal on uh, family networks and connections networks, uh, networks to get things done in China at that time. It still has some power today. But I, like I said, the research and my own experience is that it's maybe it's diminishing in power. And certainly it changes from the tier one cities, which would be like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. It would be more powerful in the smaller cities, tier two, tier three cities outside of uh, the larger cities and the more modern up-to-date cities. But it's a very important concept and what was interesting, I think, about the research is that we looked at it from an internal perspective and also from an expat perspective of how uh, research or how Guangxi is relevant or pre prevalent in society. An important concept when doing business for you to maybe do a little bit of research about this and see whether it might be something that an understanding of this concept might help you to um, advance your uh, your um, products or services. One of the things that I noticed, and, and this is my own personal take on things, is that um, our society, uh, and this is a very broad generalization, but I found that uh, the thinking patterns were quite different in China in my experience. Uh, others might have a different experience or see it through a different lens. But I found that in dealing with uh, students in dealing with um, business people, anything from CEO to, um, to you know, junior entry level to CEO positions, so right across a broad spectrum, and dealing with people in different locations, um, I found that there was a, a, a prevalence to sort of left brain uh, thinking, analytical thinking, sequential thinking, and there was less of an emphasis, and even in the education system, of creativity and right brain thinking. Again, this is changing as it's sort of um, becoming observed, an observation among society that, and that's why there's a, a great popularity still in Western education system as opposed to the Chinese education system. So a lot of uh, parents will send their children to the United States, to Europe, to uh, Australia, Canada, et cetera, to gain a sort of a different perspective. So the education system, it begins with a very rote learning, uh, you know, lecturer, professor uh, reads, students repeat, uh, less emphasis on challenging. Again, this is changing. But I found that something interesting to think about when doing business uh, in China or with Chinese, that maybe your way of thinking is completely different from their way of thinking. And definitely your way of being brought up and their way of being brought up, your way of education, their way of education, completely different. Um, so adapting to that, or at least understanding that, you know, knowledge, they say knowledge is power and having these tools and expanding on these tools in whatever direction you decide to go in is very useful, not only for China, but in my opinion, for any country that you decide you're gonna enter that market is to take the time to deeply understand the culture. I have seen people that do this and invest in culture. I've seen how successful they are and have been. So it's a very wise investment in this uh, type of research. Something that took me a little bit of time to understand um, and is a very difficult concept for Westerners entering the Chinese market. Um, it's the concept and notion of face and the idea that um, in many situations, 
your uh, Chinese counterpart might not be interested in your product or service, but they might still tell you yes. Uh, that whole idea is to save face, to uh, save their face as well as yours, to um, kind of leave the dialogue open. But if you read between the lines very often, and this is subtle, very often you can be pursuing something that you think is a done deal. And culturally, it was never a done deal. It was more of a, you know, we can continue this dialogue possibly, but it's, you know, it's a fine line. So, you know, just like I tell uh, entrepreneurial students here in Canada, don't count the deal until the deal is signed, the deal is done and the deal is paid for. Um, I also say the same thing about China is really dig deeply to understand whether the deal is actually uh, going through. And very often culturally, the contract can be signed and that's just a beginning point. Uh, modifications can be done to said contracts. Um, yeah, so yes, sometimes doesn't always mean yes, it can often mean no or maybe. And generally in my experience, it's a maybe. So I'm often asked what products uh, for the Canadian market could be suitable. Uh, sometimes people come, at, come to me and they say, you know, I'm thinking of uh, producing a certain uh, um, product and, and I will tell them directly, no, the market's already saturated. Sometimes I don't know when I ask my colleagues in China to do some research for me. Uh, sometimes these products are popular in some cities and locations and not in others. Uh, but what I have found is a very big shift right now is, you know, this could be a wrong comparison, but I look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and I look at, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old model, but it's still relevant in some ways. And this idea that we work up and down a, a pyramid of, uh, you know, at the top being self-actualization and the bottom being the basic human needs of food and a shelter, et cetera. And what I found in my time in China, in China is, which is so unique is I've seen so many people and that's why I have such value for the people. You know, people are people and there's individuals who are, you know, not good people, but as a whole, I value the culture of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, working hard to get to a better place. And that's what I experienced time in and time out in China, this desire to better uh, the state of a, uh, their individual individual lives. And uh, what I found is that now that people are sort of get, becoming wealthier and certainly people in the tier one cities I mentioned before, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, uh, these, these people have gotten to a level where they've already got, the, most of them have got the basic needs covered. And they're sort of getting into a level where they're looking at, you know, okay, I've got those needs covered. Maybe now I need to, wow, there's a lot of pollution, which is evidenced by the picture here. Albeit that's getting better, it still is alarmingly high levels of pollution in the, in the major cities. And people are concentrating more on health and gym memberships. When I first started in China, finding a good cup of coffee was not easy. Now there's coffee shops everywhere. Uh, finding a gym was not necessarily easy. Now there's gyms everywhere. But you know, supplements are becoming a big thing, health products. And where I think Canada has a great reputation is in the idea of clean air, clean water, healthy products as a general rule. So there's a big area in health products that I've identified. And there's another area where I see massive growth, which is in uh, products that are geared towards older individuals. Those you know, old age homes are sprouting out everywhere because there's a demographic uh, almost crisis in China right now, where as a result possibly of the one child policy, that there is a huge amount of people that are at retirement age and there's not enough people to service the pensions and the, uh, the uh, so, so there's a massive amount, sorry, I'm going off topic. There's a massive amount of people reaching retirement age who need those type of products and services that, um, that maybe we have strengthened. So these are kind of two angles that, that I can concentrate on now and suggest now, but there's a, a whole range of products that could be um, potentially lucrative for Canadians moving forward. So I think that taking apart again, taking away the political side, 
political situations resolve themselves over time generally. So we're either gonna go into a, way, uh, a, a world where it's uh, an us and them almost full out war, whether it be a hot war or whether it be a, you know, a, a complete divorce of, of, uh, of uh, trading, which I find with us being so intertwined, I find that unlikely, or we'll have times where we don't agree and times when we do agree, but certainly taking advantage of these economic opportunities. 1.4 billion people, uh, the largest middle class in the world who can access and want to access clean, safe products. Some of you might be aware that there was a number of um, health scares in China where uh, companies were adding um, products to, um, there was, in fact, there's one that comes to mind is the milk, uh, tainted milk uh, a scare where now a lot of Chinese people have not forgiven this or forgotten this and are buying their um, powdered milk for their children. They're buying it from New Zealand, from Canada, from Australia, because it was a case where a local company added additives to boost the content, if I understand, of the protein um, to, to, um, uh, to, to prove that it was uh, high in protein. And uh, uh, they, they, this, this actually killed uh, children. So there was sort of a period where, and these people were well uh, dealt with by the law, but there was a period where uh, there was a great deal of mistrust of local products. I think local products are gaining in kudos, but there still is a market for uh, external products, health products, uh, fitness products, longevity products, supplements, fashion, um, just a number of different areas uh, that, that Canadians could, could uh, capitalize on moving forward. Um, so where might you start? Excuse me. Uh, where might you start? Well, I had mentioned, and I think maybe I should go a little, drill a little deeper into this. I had mentioned that, that uh, um, you have sort of a tier system where uh, Beijing, is seen, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen are seen as tier one cities. They're seen as modern, uh, large middle class, um, equal in sort of services and things that you can access to any other major city in the world. Um, some of these cities, you know, moving into the tier two and tier three, tier four, are cities you might not have ever heard of that have, you know, populations that are, you know, you take Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, and a few others, and they're larger in population than those. So <clears throat> the sheer enormity, the sheer enormity of uh, China and its cities um, and the market is one that should not be ignored. It should be taken, um, you know, looked at with caution due to some of the things we've mentioned, but it should not be ignored. Um, we need, as a country, to, in my opinion, to not just be selling to the United States, but to be selling to Europe, to be selling to Asia, to be looking at these markets that are rapidly expanding and get in there early before other countries do. Uh, Australians have been fabulous in, and uh, New Zealanders in selling into China. It's hard to be honest with you to find successful Canadian products. Having said that, Tim Hortons is expanding rapidly. Uh, Canada Goose, Lululemon, these kind of companies are beginning to uh, expand rapidly, but uh, there's a lot of areas for growth uh, that other, other countries have, have uh, sort of filled that void and we need to jump in there. Tier two. <coughs> Uh, Tianjin, Chongqing, Hangzhou, uh, Ningbo, where I'm very familiar with. Um, um, we have, um, uh, my own family has a chain of grocery stores in Ningbo, my, my wife's family, I should say. Um, so I'm very familiar with Ningbo and that's a city that, you know, numerous million. Uh, Hangzhou is where a lot of tech takes place. Alibaba is headquartered there, uh, the massive uh, sort of, um, uh, uh, e-commerce uh, company, uh, the, the, uh, the Amazon of, uh, of China, if you will. Um, and a lot of other fabulous companies are located there. And uh, then you go down for the, so, so the tier ones are, are, have almost everything you could you know, conceivably want or wish to find. But as we go down the tiers, the income levels are rising and the desire to access international products is there. So people say, where do I start? And I say, well, Take a look at Canada or take a look at the United States, for examples, we can relate to. If you have a product, would you start your product in Manhattan, you know, in New York City? You probably wouldn't want to start there. You'd probably want to start in a region that was maybe less expensive. Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, real estate, whoppingly expensive. Salaries, 
quite high and comparable to salaries here in most cases. So you might want to base yourself in a tier two, a tier three city to have access to a, a less expensive work pool, probably grants for larger companies to get set up. And these are by municipality on a case by case basis. So there's so many opportunities in these tier two, tier three cities, tier four cities to look at. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier this idea of someone being a Chinese expert and how I object to that because always learning, it would be like saying someone's a United States expert, you know, okay, so tell me about potato farming in Idaho, you know, I mean, they're probably going to be a blank face. There's no such thing. <clears throat> what I can say is that um, the experience on the ground is priceless and um, there's a lot of opportunity. Just get over there and have a look or get someone over there on your behalf to have a look and research your particular product. Can it work? Will it work? How will it work? And how to do it um, are the next steps. Uh, Andrew? Yes. Uh, just a question in terms of setting up business, and maybe this is naive, uh, but it's more of a financial question. I understand that China has really rapidly gone into digital currency. What should a yeah. Canadian business owner uh, prepare for in order to negotiate the digital currency world and and uh, economics with China? Okay, um, digital currency in, in that sense is in its infancy. So it's still uh, paper money used on a regular basis for transactions with the exception of um, WeChat Pay and Alipay. So if you're a smaller business selling a product, this is a blessing. You can hop on Alibaba today and you can be selling your products within an hour. Uh, they would pay you via Alipay. Um, you could be set up for the international Alibaba, which would then allow you to transfer that money into your own um, account using Alibaba and then would be transferred to your visa or to your... So for smaller companies, these kind of things are not a challenge. For larger companies, much larger companies, there are challenges with getting... Uh, money out of China, depending on how you structure your business and moving forward. Yes, you're correct that many companies will need to be equipped with the tools to accept uh, online payments, but that's actually quite uh, straightforward to accept those payments. Now, there will be a shift as the, the RMB, the yuan, the currency uh, goes completely digital, but that's not sort of in the short term. And those um, ways of dealing with that have not yet been worked out. So these are it, right now, China is trialing a digital currency in certain markets around the country, uh, as opposed to paper uh, currency, it's all digital. And that's a state run initiative, um, which is gonna be interesting because it's gonna have an impact on international trade. But for the time being, um, being paid, you, you can be paid via Alipay, WeChat, and as an international person, you can access those tools very easily. Yeah, thanks for that, because I have heard that they have their own version of a Bitcoin that they are trialing in, in uh, Africa and in other com countries as well. Part of definitely. that one road, definitely. one belt. Yeah, definitely in its infancy, but but is happening and will happen. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, right. So so uh, social media, it's interesting is that people have said to me, um, which is I, I guess it's they're getting their information from social media here or the media here, but they said China, you know, people have said to me, China doesn't really have much of a social media uh, presence. Oh, there's no Facebook there. You know, they probably don't have social media. On the contrary, they have a very regulated, uh, a lot of censorship, of course, for key words and key expressions to keep uh, harmony and peace. There are 1.4 billion people. I am not justifying the system, but it is very challenging to keep 1.4 billion people under control. So there is a lot of censorship. There is a lot of tools which are censored and Western tools which are blocked. Now, um, to get around this, many, many Chinese citizens, which is illegal for them, but many Western citizens as well working there, which is uh, a gray area, but is fine generally access VPNs. And what VPNs do is you jump over what is called the Great Firewall of China. You jump over that and your computer can access everything because it thinks it's sitting in the Bahamas, um, you know, or sitting, sitting somewhere else. It's just a way of accessing um, uh, uh, restricted sites. But what a lot of people don't know is that the social media ecosystem in China is incredible. So WeChat is a super app. 
you know, you can pay your bills, you can hail taxis, you can communicate with people, you can, it acts as a wallet. It just, it does so many things that we have a mul a multiple apps to do the same things that one app can do. Um, but certainly, you know, we have Uber, they have Didi. Um, we have YouTube, they have Yuku. We have Google, they have Baidu. So there's, you know, incredible uh, platforms and resources there. But of course, if you are talking about I items that are deemed controversial or illegal, then those items are blocked automatically. Um, you know, and I just say to people, you know, if you want to post things on your own personal media in, in, in Canada, well, why not if you have opinions? But if you're there, respect the rules of their country, especially if you want to be doing business. Uh, it, there's no point in antagonizing the, the censors or the, or the, uh, the government um, if you wish to be pursuing uh, business. Right. E-commerce. As I hit on earlier, there are loads of opportunities for Canadian businesses that have products to sample the e-commerce market safely and effectively. Um, you know, e-commerce is predicted to be a $1.8 trillion business by 2021 in uh, China. And, you know, it's amazing because you see these uh, motorbikes, motor scooters buzzing around China with massive amounts of products probably would be illegal in Canada and pulled over by the police be because you see these, you know, TVs and on these tiny scooters. It's amazing to, to, to see, but massive amounts of products buzzing around all day around, around the, the various cities. Uh, certainly in Shanghai, where I lived, we could order things in the morning and they would effectively be ordered a few hours later in some instances. Uh, very advanced e-commerce uh, um, supply chains, uh, networks, and, uh, you know, access, anybody can access this. It's sort of a myth that you can't access this. You can easily be up and trading. We can close down this webinar, webinar very shortly, and those of you that want to could be trading by lunchtime. Um, the key challenge would be getting those products quickly to your consumers, and depending on the size of your business, whether you actually want to have stuff in China ready to dispatch from China. That's a different uh, kettle of fish, which you can uh, you can either approach me individually or you can approach others and, and get uh, advice on that. Um, but here's sort of the trends uh, moving forward. This data is from 2011. Sometimes it's challenging to get uh, up-to-date uh, data, uh, but what I'm told is this is actually quite, uh, quite similar to, to what's going on now. So uh, apparel and accessories, 68% of the consumers are, are buying apparel and um, accessories online via e-commerce. Now, they have something in China that's quite uh, famous. I believe we call it omni-channel in North America. It's called O2O, which is using um, online sales to drive people to physical stores and using physical stores to drive people back to online. So, you know, a lot of things are advertised online. A lot of people go into the stores, physically look at things and then add, uh, buy them online because in some cases it's cheaper. Um, but, you know, apparel and accessories, household goods, digital goods, consumer electronics, um, books and audio, cosmetics. Cosmetics is one I didn't mention. That is a booming industry growing by the day. Um, and uh, people really value international products. So international cosmetics, beauty products, um, and things that involve um, Canadian uh, um, sort of clean, healthy uh, products are seen as, as fabulous. Um, books, if you have books, you can sell them depending on the content of the book. Um, but really, you know, apparel and accessories and cosmetics are big uh, wins for Canadians um, looking to, uh, to access that, that uh, market. So what I'd like to suggest here, and then we can open it up if we do have questions, uh, is uh, if any of you want to contact directly uh, and discuss any, any challenges, issues, questions, or just want an informal talk about the political scene, I'm open to it, the, the business scene, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, book some time and we can, we can have a, a, a conversation together. Uh, I've put down a, a personal email uh, and just let me repeat it, those are not zeros, those are O-B-O-R, as in one belt, one road, O-B-O-R-8 at outlook.com. You can reach out and we can book a time to talk. 
Um, if you want to uh, follow via social media, um, at, at Andrew Woods too is a Twitter. Uh, uh, you can follow the, the business side of things on uh, LinkedIn, which is ADW China ASEAN Consulting Group. And of course, I have to plug my WeChat, uh, Woods A8 is my WeChat. And if you want to look at the website, One Belt, One Road, very easy, dot co.uk or dot ca in Canada. Um, and on that note, I'd be more than ha happy to open it up to questions. Um, I know there's probably a lot of questions in relation to the political side, and I'm more than happy to address those in a fair and objective manner. Um, and, uh, you know, hope we have some questions. I see. Uh, go ahead, Ruth, anything? I'm just going to say I'll, 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 I'll chirp a little bit uh, while we're waiting for people to sort of type in. You, you raised the question about housing uh, some some materials in China so yeah. that they could be dispatched easier out of that. Maybe you could just chat a little bit, you know, on a very sort of top level as to what might be some steps in sort of setting something like that up. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a product that I came across recently, um, which was health supplements that were 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 protein powders, um, uh, vitamins, mineral supplements, and uh, we suggested that a small amount was housed in in China so that they can rapidly be dispatched. Um, typically, you can get things, um, and there's a lot of creative ways to get things to China quickly, um, you know, making friends with people at the airport is one, um, but there's a lot of ways to get things quickly, but generally, if you're shipping en masse, you wanna ship it via, shi via a ship. Um, um, you know, put it on, on a, a, into a pallet, uh, onto a, a container, sorry, and uh, ship it. That's the most cost-effective way. If you're shipping a product that is something like a protein powder or a, you need to list the ingredients and those ingredients need to be listed in Chinese. When they get to the port of entry, you need someone on the other side, which would be a broker who would be able to sign for those goods for you. They then sign for those goods, take ownership of those goods, and then can transport them to wherever you want to. I mean, it's similar to bringing goods in on this side, uh, clearing customs. Very important to have the ingredients and the ingredients done in Chinese, which can easily be done through a translator, either be us, be people we know, whatever, it can easily be done. You then ship a small amount, I, be, I, I suggest, but enough to cover, you know, based on the amount of orders. What can happen and what does happen is because the society moves a lot quicker than society moves here as a general rule, people have less patience because they're used to things moving quickly. So if you want your item and you buy it, I want it now. I still have that, which I have to lessen, but I'm kind of an I want it now type guy. Um, I click, I want it here today, I want it now. It uh, doesn't always work like that and I think I've adapted or I'm adapting reasonably well. But what you don't want to do is do a pre-order and have people pre-order and then have it take six weeks to, to get there because you will just be inundated with negative comments, which can destroy you as it can destroy a company here. Um, so have some product uh, on, on hand in China and then um, have a plan to get it rapidly sent. Maybe you take, if you get an over subscription, you take a loss and you ship it by air. Uh, if you need it quickly, but make a backup plan to get your materials on the ground, which is cost effective and inexpensive. Super, thanks again for that. Sure. Um, a question's come in from Dean. He says, do you support the practice that Western companies should have an expat in China to protect that company's interests? Uh, yes, uh, probably. Um, I think that you know, for a number of reasons, for uh, things get lost in, I remember that Bill Murray movie, Lost in Communication, things really get lost in communication um, and it's very effective, but I would also uh, highlight that that person needs to uh, understand a little bit about Chinese culture. Maybe an expat who's already had an assignment in China has taken the time. The expat community, Dean, is very different from what it was 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the modern expat speaks Chinese, understands the culture, uh, is generally switched on to the trends and the dynamics of doing business in China. The older expat were people that went over and didn't learn Chinese, uh, tended to hang out. This is a generalization, but I saw it time and time again, tended to hang out in the British pubs and the Canadian, you know, or American places with speaking English, with 
Western people. Those days are kind of gone now, and the markets are quite localized in the sense that a lot of people that work in these companies have already had a great deal of exposure to Western companies and are local. So they've localized business, but I think it's a great practice to have somebody there on the ground that understands your wants and desires and needs, company mission, company values, what you want out of your relationship with China, and can be a, a sort of a bridge or a liaison between the Chinese uh, workers, Chinese consumers, and the head office. Very valuable. And yes, I think it's uh, very often overlooked now. Great. Thanks for the answer to that question. And uh, I will just close off in that uh, reiterating what you were saying before about Canadian products having a high standard in, in the world of you in terms of you know natural, wholesome, uh, clean, and you know, not just for human beings, but I'm also thinking perhaps in the pet food industry and and for other other aspects too, where uh, you know we have quite a few Canadian homegrown businesses that might take advantage of some of this China market. Definitely. And I would encourage them to reach out to you. You've got your information here, Dr. Woods, and uh, if they would like to have that consult, that would be great. May I close on one point? For sure. Um, you just hit uh, pet food. And I had spoken about how trends are changing and as more and more people are accessing and, and, and growing wealthy, um, sort of the, these things are concentrated on more. So um, things I mentioned healthcare, I mentioned you know, taking care of oneself um, and maybe working less hours. There's more talk about things that you'd never heard of 10, 15 years ago, like uh, work-life balance. You know, I've heard people use that, which is a real new one for me to, to hear, but pet food. More and more people are ha having pets and adopting pets. Pet food is a great opportunity right now. And there's just endless amounts of opportunities. Some things work, some things don't work. Um, it's trial and error. And I always say, dip your toe in, don't go full throttle and then realize that it's, uh, um, you know, it's not gonna work for you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you to everyone who joined us on this 100th anniversary of, uh, of our webinars. And thank you, Dr. Woods, for being our guest today. My Remember pleasure. that this has been recorded and it will be available on our Tech Canada website as well as on the Tech Canada YouTube site. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Woods. Thank Take you care, everyone. Thank you.